Well, welcome. My name is Carl Connor. Today is April 12, uh, 2015. We are preaching a topical sermon through some areas of Acts, and we're going to be moving on to some other books of the Bible uh, starting next week. But today we're doing some selections from Acts chapter 4 and 11. This is part of the birth of the church, and particularly about a church that fascinates me, which is the church at Antioch. I put now it just occurred to me I should have thrown up a map and I'm I, sorry I didn't do that I, I just just thought, just thought of it right now. So Antioch is to the north of Jerusalem. It's kind of on the uh, if you're to think in, in the in Mediterranean where Turkey uh, comes in uh, that the country, modern day country of Turkey it's right at that juncture up in there. So kind of the upper right hand corner or the northeast uh, corner of the Mediterranean Sea is where it's at. So last week we talked about how God want to well, okay, yeah, it's the 19th. Sorry about that. Yes, it says it's the 19th. You're right, it's the 19th. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, it's, apparently I messed up the slide. Uh, on there, um, we, last, week, last week on April 12th, we talked about the, um, that God planned the church and had intended for us to be able to have um, this opportunity for people to learn about him and learn about uh, God and his son through the church and some of the things that were there. And so, you know, that's sort of, I sort of want to start the conversation with that. Okay, so God has this plan that churches should exist. We talked again about the idea of the universal church, which will gather one day. It will be all, all the believers, all the saints of all places and all times gathered together, and that will be at the end of time. And we use that word universal church. But then there's the local church, our, our, our local, like this is a local church. Our locality, as I talked about, is on the Internet. Well, let me get back into that then and ask you all a question. Put your hands over the keyboard and ask you this interesting question. How does God start churches? How does God, I mean, we, we all have agreed that he does it, right? So, so how, how does he do that? And then just kind of in general, what, what, what are some things that starts the ball rolling towards a new church happening? What are, what are some of the things I mean, does God just like send an email and say, hey, I need a church over on the corner of, you know, First and, 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 and Oak, and would somebody please go there? Okay, so Kim says he gathers people together. That's a great phrase, Kim, because we did talk about that, that there's the gathered people of God. So he gathers them together. Okay, and so I think that's relevant for us because he was gathering some of us together. Okay, Eileen says he moves a heart in his direction. I think that's awesome. Yes, you're absolutely correct. And so he moves somebody's heart, maybe more than one person's heart. Okay, Paul says individuals brought together for a purpose. I think that's pretty good. I like that. And so it's sort of interesting as God is working, God does this. And in fact, to be candid, every church has a life cycle. Every church is kind of planned. There's a part before it's born. It's born. It's created. It grows. It matures. It comes towards an end. And yes, indeed, almost all local churches die. As I'm fond of saying, there are no local churches that are 2,000 years old. I, I can't take you to the First Baptist Church of Antioch, that's a joke, and, and go and say, you know, look, here, you know, this, is, this has been in existence. It is a normal cycle that churches come in, they grow, they reach their maturity point, and they die. So um, you know, I think we're still in our growth phase. Don't want to scare anybody there. But just as a, as a quick comment with that, that this is a, is a natural cycle. And I've actually come into churches at all of those cycles now uh, where um, I've, I've helped churches obviously be born. I've helped them grow. And at least in one instance, it was, uh, it was my job to, to help, sorry, uh, help the church go out with dignity. Uh, that happened in a church in Irving, and uh, some of y'all might know part of that story. And that was, that was hard. That was, a, that was a hard job, but it was a job somebody had to do uh, to try and do it. And because we went out with dignity, we were able to help strengthen some other churches. So that was sort of interesting. Well, so this is relevant to then what's happening here in Antioch. Uh, think about this idea that they're in Jerusalem, the apostles are in Jerusalem, and they are the center of what's happening. I mean, they're it. The apostles are it. They are the ones, and they are here in Jerusalem. They were the ones that walked with Jesus, and they are the ones that talked with him, and they slept beside him, and they watched him be crucified. They personally saw him raised from the dead, and all of a sudden, they have this mandate to create a new church, and they're in Jerusalem. They are it. And the church in Antioch is going to have nothing to do with them when it starts. Let's watch what happens. And that's, that's what I was like, that's interesting. <laughs> okay. So Acts chapter four. 
All right, so this is Peter and the other folks are there, right? I'll give you a little background what's happening in Jerusalem first. Some of you had just read me, heard some of this. So I apologize if, you know, for hearing it twice, but I think that that's kind of good. So Acts chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, this is the crowds, the priests and captains of the temple and the Sadducees came up to them greatly annoyed. I would simply comment that whenever you are preaching, even if you're preaching of God and so forth, in a way that people don't like or not used to, they will be greatly annoyed. Now, in this particular case, these people who are greatly annoyed are not Christians. But let me tell you what. There are some Christians who will get greatly annoyed if you're not doing church the way that they think you should do church. He's commenting. All right. They're greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. And many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Okay, so I'm not totally sure if the 3,000 we had before was increased by two, making a total of five, or whether we've got five more, making a total of eight. But let me tell you what, that is a big Sunday school class. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> just going to tell you, they have had some pretty massive church growth here in a matter of days. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Ananias, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family, and by, when they set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Well, what's the this? Well, there's a crippled man that was there that Peter has healed, and he's there with them. And so they're wanting to know, by whose authority did you do this? Is that really the important question? No, but it's the only question they can probably think to ask if you follow, right? And they're, they're, they're going to, you know, kind of, what is this smelling like? Well, it smells like they're going to probably accuse them of demon possession and working with Satan is probably where they're headed here. Y'all follow? You know what I'm saying? This is what they're, they're, they're kind of, this is what they're headed toward. By what power and by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man and by what means this man has been healed, and he just, I'm going to pause right there, because if that's really the question you're asking us is how did this guy get healed, right? Okay, I'll answer that question. But that's not really the question you're asking me, but I'll play along. We'll go through that. If we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, and by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of, wait for it, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. Okay, so basically they, they killed Jesus for blasphemy. They're waiting to see if they're going to be able to kill Peter too. Are you going to double down on Jesus or are you going to get smart and say, oh, it was the Lord God, and we would say Yahweh, but he wouldn't say that, but the Lord God, right? He wouldn't utter his name, of course, all right? Uh, or, or, or we're going to double down on this Jesus dude and, and, and obviously dig you know, Peter digging his own grave deeper, so to speak. And, and how is this going to go? Right. And he not only says Jesus's name, he makes it very specific. Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah or anointed one. So, you know, when, when Mary, of course, uh, you know, had, gave birth to Jesus, she didn't name him Jesus Christ. Right. His name was Jesus and so forth. But that, that, that title of Christ or Messiah, is something that, that then we as Peter places on it. So Jesus Christ or the Christ the anointed one of Nazareth. There's no doubt who he's talking about. And by the way, whom you crucified, let me just point out, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is, and he's referring back now to an Old Testament prophecy, that the builders would reject the one stone that's the most important one in the building. What building? Put your hands on the keyboard. What building is in fact being built? Jesus is the cornerstone of what building? It's the skyscraper that's in downtown New York, right? That's the building. What, what, what is this building that, we're, that, that God is building up? Yeah, church. In fact, can you change your spelling, Paul? And can you make that first C, an uppercase C, and type it again, if you don't mind? It's, it, it's the universal church. That, that, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. It, it's not some local New Testament church. It's the overarching church. I know it's a, it's a tiny point there. But yeah, that's what he's building. And Christ is the cornerstone of his Church, big C. Yes, absolutely. And so, uh, so Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is, no, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
Now, put your hands over on the keyboard and answer me this question. If we were going to go to Baskin Robbins and we were going to buy ice cream for all you guys, what flavor of ice cream would you want to get? I've locked up the entire church. Okay. And Paul says all 32. Nope. You have to pick one. Sorry. One scoop. And we'll give you one scoop of all 32. Ginger says Spumoni. Okay. Shri goes with Rocky Road. Okay. Jamocha almond fudge. Boy, I'm getting hungry. This is good. Paul, nothing. Really? Can't do one? Kim goes with coffee. I wouldn't have thought that one, Kim. That's awesome. All right. Okay. Okay. Peanut butter and chocolate. Now, can I tell you that absolutely no questions asked, Rocky Road is better than coffee? Can I prove that to you? Or that clearly Spumoni is better than peanut butter and chocolate? Absolutely no questions asked. I can prove it to you. Can I prove that? Ginger says, nope, 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 nope. Okay, so here's the point. There are matters in life that are simply a matter of preference. And to be candid, I can't prove to you vanilla is better than chocolate or chocolate is better than strawberry. I can't do that. Those are all personal choice. Many people regard religion as a personal thing with the nature of it being a personal choice, which if you press them ultimately comes down to the following type of statement. Whatever you believe for yourself is true for yourself. I actually used to say that all the time. Think about that for a second. There are fundamental pieces that, in fact, must be either a right answer or a wrong answer. Sarah and I were talking about this the other day. There are some individuals who say there is one and only one God, and some say that there are many. So if you spoke to a Hindu who says that there's 10,000 gods, and you speak to somebody, even if you're speaking to somebody in Judaism, a, a person who's Jewish, and says there's one God, one says there's one, one says there's 10,000 gods. Somebody's wrong. OK, I mean, it's, it can't be, well, what you believe in your universe is this. And this is no, I'm sorry, guys. And so it's much more. <clears throat> how should we say this? Um, religion is much closer to mathematics than it is ice cream. OK, if you're in a room of students and everybody goes to work a problem, you may come up with many different answers. If people are not used to working that particular math problem, some answers may be right. Some may be wrong. Some may be wrong, but closer to the truth than others. If the right answer, just to pick a joke, if the right answer is 42, right? Then some other folks, Life, Universe, and everything from, you know, there you go, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If the right answer is 42 and somebody says 43, they're closer than somebody that says 5,000, but they're still wrong. You all get the deal? And the point is, is that religion is much more like mathematics than it is ice cream. It is not a matter of personal choice. I mean, how do we know that? Well, I would say I would know that because there was one and only one religion where there was one person, Jesus Christ, who called it beforehand and said, I'm going to die and be brought from the dead, and I'm going to show you. Watch. Watch it happen. And it did. No other religion has something like that. And that is one of the reasons why, not the only, but one of the main reasons why I decided Christianity is worth a second and a third and a fourth look. And in fact, why I ultimately decided Christianity is the truth. So and there, in the verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Is that arrogance to say that we alone are correct as Christians? Well, we didn't say it. God did. Sorry, but God gets to call this one because he's God. And we're re repeating what he said. And that's not arrogance. That's simply repeating the true answer, kind of like 42. So <clears throat> verse 13, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. Now, <clears throat> there's a couple of different ways to look at the fishermen, Peter, John, the other folks that are there. One is that they were really actually pretty astute. They spoke multiple languages, spoke both the Aramaic and probably some Greek. They could probably do some accounting and mathematics because they kept the books probably for their fishing fleets. I, I don't think that they were dumb. Okay. However, they were uneducated, if you all follow the point. And so if you look at Christianity and say, and this is what some people would tell you, oh, Christianity was made up by individuals, by this group of fishermen, and they put together the whole story. And we're like, really? They invented this whole idea that a man would be born of a virgin and come together to fulfill the prophecies, and they would live a sinless life to take on all of our sins and then die and then be resurrected? I mean, really? This is, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no offense, but this is, as they say, the greatest story ever told. I mean, this is one of the main, you know, phenomenal pieces. And so uh, it's rather unrealistic to think of it in that sense. 
So when they saw that they were uneducated common men, and they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Skipping now further into the story a little bit. Um, and so this is where they've been persecuted, and now they're praying afterwards, the apostles are, and praying, and this, uh, I kind of pick up in the middle of their prayer. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. This is a phenomenal prayer. This is one that you might want to jot down for yourself. Help me, Lord, help me speak with boldness. There may be some of you here today, there may be somebody listening to my voice on the video afterwards, who are too bold. And by that, I mean you are too aggressive that you are absolutely turning people off with how much you talk about Jesus. Bless your hearts. It's a great problem to have. Okay, that, that is, it is possible to do so. However, comma, I will suggest most of us could use a smidge more boldness. Can I get an amen to that? that, that so forth? Are you, are, you, are you in the, no, no, I need to tone it down camp? And I said, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. Yeah, amen, amen. Yep, yeah, okay. <laughs> yep, okay, all right. So this is, I mean, this is the apostle speaking, and they're saying, Lord, let us continue to speak with boldness. Peter's pretty bold. He's going to die for his faith here. All right, so. <clears throat> Let us continue to speak with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal. And signs and wonders, signs and wonders, what does that mean? Well, signs where things happen like someone is healed, and wonders like there are miracles that are occurring. So signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. We don't know if that was an earthquake or what happened, but <laughs> God said, yeah, I hear you. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continue to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. This one heart and soul is this unity. The Greek word for it is koinonia. It's, it means a, a fellowship of sharing, and that even when there is a problem, you come together to work it out. It doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. In fact, I'm going to be honest with you, church hurts and church problems are probably among some of the most painful problems you're ever going to have. Okay, I just going to share with you that comment that when, when you get hurt in the church, it's probably the, one of the deepest wounds you're probably ever going to have. But with koinonia, with this fellowship, this one heart, one soul, even when problems arise, we try to work it out as best we can amongst the church. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. So they shared and they had, they supported each other. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and Great grace was upon them all. What a great prayer as well. Lord, let us speak with boldness, and may great grace be upon us. Continue now with Acts chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. But when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him. What's a circumcision party? Well, it's a group of people who believe that you could only be a Christian if you were circumcised. Now, there's a long-standing tradition in the Old Testament, dating back to Abraham, that circumcision was a sign of people being of God. And that, that there, I mean, it's, 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 in order to be a Jew, this is part of the process. That makes sense. But now suddenly you had individuals who were there in these other areas who were Hellenist. Hellenist. Does that mean they were born from Helen? What does that mean, Hellenist? Hellenist. If we were to go find Hellenists today, we'd be looking for people from the modern nation of... Yeah, I mean, it says Greeks. They be from Greece. You're absolutely correct. So, yes, so yes, the Hellenists here would be people who uh, perhaps uh, would be uh, Greek Jews, three points out. Yeah, there you go. The, um, they're probably, if they were Jews, they may or may not have actually been sick or from size. So you probably got a mixed one. So, Hellenists could be used here a couple different ways. But with that, um, so you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. So the key concept is here, do you have to first become a Jew before you can become a Christian? Is that part of it? Or, in fact, is it possible to become uh, a Christian and the Jewish part is off to the side? So the, the circumcision is in, is in question. The part that I, I read, although I chose not to focus on for this one because I focused on last time I preached through Acts, was the whole food laws. The food laws were, were there. And so you can go back and look at my previous uh, sermons on that or you can read for yourself where the food laws that were specifically for the Jews are, specific, are set aside now. They don't apply anymore, particularly not to those. So part of becoming a Jew is of becoming circumcised. Part of it is obeying the food laws. 
These things are set aside. No, that's not part now of the grace of God. That's not how this is going to work. And so you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. And he talks about now the whole idea of the sheet coming down from heaven and the various foods in it and how horrified he was that you're, I'm not going to eat unclean things. And God says, hey, what I've made isn't unclean. So interesting as that goes through there. And then let's focus on what happens then when he says, after all that happened with the sheet, he says, and behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. What does making no distinction mean here? Peter said being told, make no distinction. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. What does that mean? As the pastor pauses for a sip of coffee. The Spirit told him to go with them, making no distinction. Okay, no difference between them. You're definitely on the right track. Let's go a little further. No difference between them. Not stand out. Good. Okay, almost there. These men are not, no discrimination between the groups. What groups? You're almost there. What groups are in question? There's some folks here who are from one group and some from another group, and Peter's going to go with the ones Okay, don't think of different Jew and Greek Gentiles. Yeah, there you go. So this is, I mean, just to back up, I don't do this often, but I'm going to now for the slides. I'm going to go backwards for a second. And so he said that back that it said that you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. And so this is the distinction is this idea of these are guys who are not Jews. You, you fellowshiped with them. You uh, ate, you broke bread with them. You stayed with them. You talked with them. You associated with them. I mean, these are, let's see, what phrase can we put in here that would be, uh, you know, for, for today's society? I can't believe you hung around with fill in the blank. Let's see, as your mind goes over, uh, if you saw your so forth, right? Riff raff, I like it. Riff raff is good. All right, so depending upon what area of society you're from, you may either um, uh, raise up or lower down various groups, right? If you're in the white collar crowd and you wear normally wear a tie and so forth, and you're in that part, what might be a group of American society today that you might sort of not be the ones you'd normally hang out with? I'm not just I'm just trying to in generality here, right? Okay, blue collar. I would even go further. Let's say um, what Paul, Paul goes with lawyers. Okay, I was thinking somebody might put in like a motorcycle gang. Uh, <laughs> That might be, you know what I'm saying? Or someone over on the fringe, a bit more like that, if you follow. Or perhaps maybe punk rocker with, you know, really, you know, tall spike, you know, different colored hair or something like that. And with all due respect, on the other side of the coin, if you are the motorcycle gang or the motorcycle riders or whichever your point would be, right? If you're in, in that part of it, um, you might very well look down on the people wearing ties, right? And, and, and with all due respect, listening to my voice just right now today, I have folks who lean more to one side and to the other side, both amongst you all today. Isn't that kind of fun? Just commenting. Uh, but, <laughs> I have, but, but folks, yes, no, okay. So there's, there's distinctions that are made where both sides right now look down at the other in some degree. Is that, is that fair? I think it is. Um, but, you know, like, you know, I can't judge a book by its cover. Eileen says, sure, there you go. So it's kind of, kind of interesting. All right. So making no distinction, but whether they were Gentile or Jew, and these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house. Let me pause, and let's think about that for a second. The Gentile who's uncircumcised, who's not even a Jew, has seen an angel standing in his house. And the angel says to the uncircumcised Gentile, send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. Peter's observing the same thing happened to them just like happened to him at Pentecost. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, how oh, John baptized you with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Sorry, that one got clipped out there. Sorry, Spirit should be at the end. If then God gave the same gift to them that he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who 
was I that I could stand in God's way. I think this is a really important principle. I, I don't have this as a takeaway, but I probably should have added it as one. So maybe you want to grab your journals now and just sort of jot this down. A good way to figure out where to do God's work is to watch and see where he's working and join him in that. All too often, we invent some new work. I think we should do this. And then we say, God, would you please bless it? And he's like, that's great. Not a bad idea, but not what I'm doing right now. Instead, you find where God is working and you join him in his work. And that is what Peter has done here. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God saying, then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is an important point because at this point, the, uh, the apostles are realizing, so we're, we're it. We're it. We're, we're, we're the apostles who were here in Jerusalem. And we, we, were, we walked with God, and we received the Holy Spirit, and we're here, and absolutely, we're it. Jerusalem is the center, except God apparently decided to do stuff in other places too. And this is relevant to how God plants churches. Because God will break loose in all kinds of ways, in all kinds of places. And once things are established and normal and become the establishment, if you will, he's really fond of them saying, that's great. Y'all keep doing what you're doing. I'm going to go over here now and go and start something totally brand new. And how the establishment will respond to that thing that is different says something about the establishment. Now, in this case, I'm really proud of how the establishment handled it because they, they didn't fight it. At that point, they said, well, God's working there, and I don't know how this happened, but apparently he is, so we're going to get behind this. And they did. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Who is Stephen? Why is Stephen significant? Stephen was the first what? Eileen's quick on the keyboard, and she says, the first martyr. He's the first Christian martyr, the first Christian to die for his faith, okay? And by the way, there are people dying for their faith today. If you read the news, um, there was uh, 12 people who were killed on a boat coming over from Africa to Italy just in the last couple of weeks that they were thrown over the rail because they were Christians. I don't know if you all caught that story or not. But anyway, um, yeah, so Stephen was the first martyr. And so what's interesting is, w would you agree with me when St Stephen is stoned? Would you agree with me, yes or no, that that's a tragedy? That, that's a horrible tragedy that that person was killed? Yeah, that's a tragedy. Would you believe me if I said incredible good came from that tragedy? Yeah. So, so what, what good came from that? Because of that persecution, the word of God, the people scattered. They, they poof, and they went out. Where did they go? To Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. They went all these different locations. And so they were scattered and hiding. But even in their hiding, they still felt compelled to tell the story, this greatest story ever told. And so they start telling it in these other locations. Most of them just to the Jews. But, verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also. Hellenists, these are the Greeks are there. Preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So this is another example. This crazy thing happened with Peter. Now there's something crazy happening up in Antioch. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Go, go, go look at that. You need to go figure out what's going on. So they sent Barnabas. And he came and saw the grace of God. And he was glad. And he exhorted them to all remain faithful, faithful to the Lord for, with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So what does Barnabas do? He says, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. So he knows that Saul has converted to become a Christian. And Saul, of course, is going to be named Paul. And I'll, I'll use that name from here. So Paul is, is, to be candid, is trying to figure out his life because his entire life was built on this one interpretation of what things was. And in one moment, you know, Paul's life changes, and now he's a Christian. And to be honest, he's trying to figure out how to deal with it. Okay? And so Barnabas goes to look for him. How was it that Barnabas knew to go look for that person, to go look for Paul? Well, probably the Holy Spirit 
guided him, but he's also got a really good heart and he sees the possibilities in people. I got to be honest with you. You know, if this was, you know, if you're in one group over here, if you're, you're in the white collar tie wearing group to go looking for, for, for Saul, who's Saul's kind of been you know, now, I mean, he, he was killing these people. He, he's, I mean, yes, we all know he's become a Christian, but still he, he's, this is certainly not the person that I'm, uh, you, would you want him leading a church? Think of the things, think of the things that he has done. Would we want to get this guy? It's sort of like going over to the motorcycle crowd and going over and getting somebody over there. I hope I'm not making too big a distinction there with that, but I think you'll get the point. So Barnabas sees the possibility in Paul, and he goes and reaches out for him and brings him back. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now in those days, the prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and the one named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. Now, I happen to love these verses for, for our church for a reason I'll explain in a second. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it by the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Okay, so the, the church in Jerusalem is it. It's the center. And they need help. And this new ragtag crazy thing of a church in Antioch that suddenly pulled up and pulled together and suddenly they're praising God they send financial help to the mothership. You all follow me? This, this is the irony of this entire conversation, is the church that is the center of it all, the church in Jerusalem, needs financial help. And the church in Antioch says, no problem, we can help you out. And they send things in. This is what, believe it or not, has happened at Stepping Stones. I know we're little, but guys, when you give those gifts over PayPal, when you help us out and you go through and do that, or you send in checks and go through and do that, we reach a point, and we're actually at that point again right now, where we need to figure out, because we have more money than we can use as a church, and so we need to now give some of it away to help out various places. We've helped out a um, number of areas. We're getting ready to do that here in the next couple of weeks, where I'm going to start talking to you about where should we be giving to. When I talk to other pastors about how much our church gives out of our budget, most church plants have to take in. They have to, they, 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 church plants go and say, would you please help us out? Because we, we don't have enough to be, you know, be self-sufficient and go with that. We from day one have been in the black and we have always given out. And I really love that about us. I think it's really fascinating to watch our model and go through and do that. Kind of cool. Okay. So thank you for your giving. Please continue in your giving. And we need to now decide how to actually give some of that. What can we do with some of those things? Kind of cool. Let's go ahead and do some takeaways. I've got, Two, but the second one has like four parts. So <laughs> the first one is God intends to use the church to reach the world. It's the uppercase big C universal church. God intends to use the church to reach the world. This is his goal. This is his plan that he will use the church to reach out and all, touch all those different people. If you're listening to my voice today, you are part of that plan. You personally, how God has wired it up, the house you live in, the jobs you have, the family you were given, bless them, uh, right? All the various uh, folks that are around you, your friends. Um, these are all things that are tools God has given you to be able to be used. And I don't mean use people like use them in a bad way. I mean like be able to carry the message to them and through them to various corners of the world. Okay, so number one, God intends to use the church to reach the world. Number two. Okay, God creates new churches because, and I'm relying some now upon my seminary education to fill in some of these answers here, just so you're aware of it. They don't directly come from the text, but I think that they're relevant to the text and to what's going on. And you can pick out some of these in there. So number, so uh, letter A, they reach different types of people. And I think that that's supported what we saw there. The Jews in Jerusalem suddenly see Peter talking to these folks in Joppa. And the work that's being done there is for people who are that they're they've never been circumcised, and they're different, or the gen, the Hellenists that are up in Antioch. These are new churches that are arising that are different types of people. New churches are very good at finding new areas. I used the phrase last word demographic. Demographic means people who come together, the type of people who are in a church. So the, the new churches tend to reach different types of people. Could be all kinds of different ways to reach it, but that's one of the things Stepping Stones does very good is it cuts across all these different layers, I think, in a wonderful way. I love our diversity. 
B, they grow faster. Would you, anyone like to guess what percentage of Southern Baptist churches baptized exactly zero people in a typical year? What percentage of them, that varies year to year, but very roughly, what do you think? How many people baptize zero in a year? Okay. She goes 95. She goes way high. It's not quite that, not quite that high. Uh, zero for in a year, but, <laughs> but, but it, it, it is, uh, it, I'll go give you a hint. It's actually about 50. It's about 50% or thereabouts. She goes, woo, like nobody, nobody gets baptized in Southern Baptist. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I didn't go with that. Um, but from that, What's important to note is that we just count the number of baptisms that we have had in the last couple of years here at Stepping Stones. I know it sounds really funny, but our baptisms put us on, on, on range with somebody that is, you know, with a church that has like about 100 or so members, maybe 125. It's really funny. So, you know, the little church plants grow faster. Now, we don't have to continue growing by getting people in who need to hear about becoming a Christian, being baptized and doing that. And why do we count baptisms as a question? Well, you, people will say a lot of things and pray a lot of things, but when you actually go to actually dunk people under the water, that's when the rubber hits the road for a lot of people. Okay. And it's easier to count baptisms than it is salvation sometimes. So that's why we often use that as a, as a best gauge uh, for, for growth. So church plants grow faster. We grow and we add more people. And I don't just mean number, but I mean in terms of baptism and kingdom work. Percentage wise, we're huge guys. It's really, it's really, I mean, those of you, I mean, I just count the number of folks listening to me right now that I know I, I've uh, either been involved in your, your salvation, your rededication, your baptism, some major part of there. And uh, I thank God for that. No question about it. Okay. More people get involved. More people get involved. By that, um, I mean that within the church, they're, they're, uh, they're active and they're involved. They're not just sitting back in a pew and uh, whatever. I just go to the church because uh, it's something you're supposed to do. They think about the sermon. They pray about it. They're involved in it. They pray for the pastor. Thank you. Um, they pray for the pastor's family. Thank you. Thank you. Um, they uh, are, you know, number of things that are related to that. They get involved in the church. And that really goes into then the last one, which is D. People have greater ownership when they help build it. You all are helping to build this church. Okay, through your participation, through your comments, the things you do, through your participation on Facebook, through your financial contributions, through your prayers, you are involved in making this happen. And I can't thank you enough for that. And that's why I think it's really huge. The joke one of the folks puts in uh, related to church growth is no one washes rental cars. Okay, well, okay, the guy the rental car company does. But you follow my point, people who, who rent rental cars don't generally wash rental cars. Okay. Do you wash your own car? Sure. Maybe you wash it yourself. Maybe you run it through the car wash. But somehow or another, if it's dirty, you say, wow, that car is dirty. I really should do something about it because it's my car, my truck. You all agree, right? Can I get an amen for that? That you, you, you feel differently if it's your own, if you have your own ownership there? Yep. Amen. All right. So that's one of the big pieces there. And I, I, so because you all are helping to build stepping stones, this is your church. Okay? And I think it's very, very important to see it in that capacity. As we talk about this process for the Constitution and bylaws, I will, I'm going to take a first cut on them, and then I'm going to present them to you guys, and we're going to talk about them, and then eventually we're going to vote on them. Okay, we'll work through the, the logistics on that as to how exactly that will come together. But I'll, you know, yes, I'm going to take a first cut, but I want you to all to participate and be involved. With that, in the weeks ahead, we're going to talk about what some of our core beliefs are. I strongly, strongly encourage you to go to the Stepping Stones website, thesteppingstonesproject.com, and go to what we believe and read over that um, so that we can, you can be familiar with it and see if there are things you agree with, don't agree with, if there are things you would think we should add, things that you wish we would subtract, things that you wish we would change. That's coming, and so think about that and pray over that and uh, look forward to having feedback on that one. That gets us to our question of the week. What? One thing would I change about stepping stones if I could? If you could change one thing about this church, what would you change? Now, last week I asked you all to give me some feedback on what the church meant to you. Some of you gave me some information, some did not. I would love for you, if you would, please go back to last week's question and do that one first. Okay, email it to me, text it to me, call, leave me a voicemail. I'm open to ideas. 
But I'd like to hear last week's question, what does this church mean to you? If you haven't filled that one out, please do that one. Post it on Facebook if you want. Like sure you did. Whatever you want. And then we'll get to this one. What one thing could I change? This one I really thought, this one's not so much a Facebook question. This one's more, I'd like to hear about this one on email. If you could change one thing, if you please send me an email, one or two sentences. It doesn't have to be a book, guys. We'll go through and follow through. And I, I, obviously, we're not going to change everything everybody asks for. But it helps me know if you were something here that you're like, hey, I just wish this one part was a little bit different um, and so forth. That would be uh, something there yeah, I think is, is relevant. Okay. So what one thing would I change about stepping stones if I could? And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for this church. I ask you to please be with us, guide us, watch over us, and help us most of all to glorify you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Okay, so we're going to set up now for song number four, and I think we've got we got queued up for that one. Oh, shake. Okay, so that we ended up up a good one. All right, so last week we were talking about that if you if Jesus Christ comes into your life, that you should be changed, and um, so uh, this one is uh, this this will get you get you going for the rest of your day. And this is uh, if God comes in and change your life, you should shake. We'll start this one on the count of three. Ready? One, two, Shake like you've been changed. Woohoo! Gotta get you going. All right. <laughs> All 
Oh, I forgot to cut the recording. Sorry, guys.